last week. <laughs> all right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, first of all, welcome back to official in-person events. It feels very good. I know Mick is very excited. Um, so welcome to the first talk of the spring semester um, science luncheon series at CVL. And we're going to continue to follow the best practices as we've been doing, uh, namely keeping our masks on while we're in events, um, keeping, you know, elbows length uh, apart in your in your seats out there and refraining from eating and drinking until the talk is over. Upon which, if you are SVP, there is a lunchbox out here on this table waiting for you afterwards. Um, so, uh, and we'll continue um, working in this way until we're told otherwise by the administration. So, so now I would like to introduce our first speaker of the semester, uh, Dr. Jinping Chen. Uh, he's an associate professor of mechanical engineering here at UT Dallas. And his research is really interesting, obviously. That's why we've invited him to come. He uses um, biotransport properties and uh, nanoscale technology methods to find creative ways to study things at the molecular level. For our interests, um, he's recently found a way using gold-covered receptors in some way that I don't understand because I'm not an engineer um, to temporarily open up the blood-brain barrier um, for delivery of chosen things that we want into the blood-brain barrier. And so he's going to come um, talk to us about this work today. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Chen. Thanks, Dr. Kennedy, for the invitation and the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, people on the sky. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of first uh, Sandra giving a hybrid form, so that's kind of interesting for me as well. So uh, today I'd like to tell you a little bit about our work on using nanoparticles, nanoscale interface with the brain uh, with light and, uh, nan nan light and nanoparticles. Uh, this is a you know uh, excuse me. this is a slightly different audience. Uh, I, I I guess I don't typically give the audience uh, talk to uh, uh, this audience. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask, and I'll be happy to address them. So our lab has been uh, is focusing on sort of this more interdisciplinary area of uh, nano bio nanoparticles biological systems, specifically in the brain and uh, uh, detecting viruses and. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll be focusing on the brain barrier today, but some of the other things we're working on include trying to control protein activity with the laser and nanoparticles and try to rapidly diagnose diseases uh, such as you know, respiratory infections with nanoparticles. So I think I can uh, pretty, pretty much save a lot of this uh, words by saying there's a lot of uh, impact in the brain and neurological diseases. Uh, and then you can, you know, there's a there's a lot of uh, different age distribution of different disorders, and uh, from a scientific point of view, it's you know, the brain is just hugely complex. It has uh, you know, billions and trillions of neurons and uh, connections, and uh, you know, it is one still one of the uh, greatest mysteries in science and uh, biggest challenges in medicine. So. Uh, uh, so the NIH has launched this uh, brain initiative some years ago, and a uh, big focus is try to develop new tools, try to uh, use light, uh, magnetic field, sound, genetic, and other tools to better understand the brain in order to treat or diagnose brain diseases. So uh, from, from, uh, from, from a mechanical engineer or bioengineering point of view, uh, I look at the brain uh, from in terms of two variants. So first is what's all called a diffusion barrier. So this relates to the uh, extracellular space in the brain. And why this is interesting in this, the brain is that uh, the, the brain has a very narrow extracellular space on the order of you know, nan nanometers. And obviously this is highly heterogeneous. And this poses a, a diffusion barrier if you want to deliver therapeutics into the brain. And there's a lot of interest in using advanced imaging, such as this one, uh, super-resolution uh, super optical imaging to look at the structure. And to give an example on this barrier, so if you inject, directly inject to, uh, the drug, your, your drug to the brain, it actually wouldn't travel far. 
And you, you have to use a method, for example, this convection enhanced delivery, which means you apply pressure to push the drug you know, to reach uh, a larger brain area. Of course, this comes with some limitations as well. The second barrier it refers, uh, we're interested in is the blood brain barrier. So in the, in the, the brain is a highly metabolic active uh, algae and uh, there's you know, 400 miles of blood vessels, uh, capillaries, and uh, the smallest the capillary is where the blood brain barrier sits and it's you know it's a complicated a unique structure that maintains a uh, very optimal environment for the brain and but it's also uh, pose a big challenge for drug penetration and uh, there's this is a reason why there's a, a high rate of failure for new therapeutics in the area um, there, you know, there's a lot of interest in interfacing the brain using different materials. You might have heard of, uh, you know, planting uh, uh, electrodes, you know, large or small. There's a lot of interest in making smaller and flexible electrodes in, in the brain. Uh, we are, and others are interested in uh, interfacing the brain with the nanoscale materials, and this includes both synthetic as well as biological materials. So there's a there's an article recently on nature methods uh, called Time for Nano Neuro. So it basically says the you know, uh, upcoming field Nano Neuro defined as the intersection of nanoscience and neuroscience that aims to develop nanoscale method to record and stimulate neural activity. And the nanoscience would make a major methodological contribution to the future of neuroscience and more general to biomedical science. I think uh, this is uh, correct, uh, but also a little, uh, I, I would also extend that I think nanoscale materials, nanoscience can also contribute to uh, understand and overcome the barriers in the brain I have uh, mentioned uh, before. So, so the focus of our work is um, nanomaterials for brain barriers. And I'll, today I'll give you two examples. One on the interstitial or extracellular space barrier, uh, try to use uh, this type of photosensitive vesicles, try to understand and measure the properties of the barrier. And secondly, uh, as Dr. Kennedy mentioned, uh, we published some work on uh, crossing the blood brain barrier, and I'll show you our work in that area and the recent advances. So, uh, the first barrier, the extracellular space barrier, this is actually related to the no normal brain function, and specifically what's called a uh, volume transmission, or uh, this is compared. Uh, with the wire transmission, which means the neuron to neuron uh, electrical communication. Uh, this volume uh, transmission refers to that the cells uh, release, uh, active release, for example, uh, neuropeptides that diffuse a local distance to modulate brain activity. So that it uh, behaves very differently from the wire or synaptic transmission. And this is uh, also relevant as I introduced for drug delivery. We would like to know uh, how do the neuromodulators or drugs diffuse and act in the brain? So how, far, how fast do they travel? How far do they travel? So how do we study this? Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, interest in developing uh, what's all called caged compounds. So this is basically using chemistry by bringing two molecules together. You have a caging chrome fork. And once uh, you put this caging chromophore on the molecule, it becomes inactive. And uh, once you introduce to the biological system, you can shine light to separate these two. So it, it recovers this function. It's found wide use. For example, there's caged glutamate, caged GABA, caged calcium, and so on. You can also make a caged peptide. The challenge is that uh, with this type of method is that you can only make one caged molecule at a time, okay? And uh, for peptides, this is particularly challenging because there's uh, enzymes that are actively degrading the peptides. So once you put it in the brain, it'll degrade very quickly. And, it and this also requires UV light excitation. So what we need is actually a method that can uh, be scalable for many different molecules that you can use uh, peripherally in vivo, and you can use different light sources such as the infrared light, which uh, affords a uh, deeper brain penetration. So, uh, so we uh, adapted a method using what's called a gold coated nano vesicles. So, in short, how this works is that we have a nano vesicle. This can be a liposome, it's made of lipid molecules. 
uh, you all have had your vaccine, so a COVID vaccine, you know, there's lipid uh, particles in there. This is a different form. And by putting gold particle on there, we can make the optical active. So you can use light to, uh, to release the molecules encapsulated inside. And it gives a, a nice uh, near infrared uh, absorption in the 7, 800 nanometers. As you can see here, once we shine the light, the fluorescent molecules get rapidly released and it diffuses away. And this uh, this speed is really important because we want to, you know, a lot of the processes in the brain are very fast. So this having a very uh, rapid release on the order of milliseconds is very helpful. Could I ask, what is the role of, why do you coat the lysosome with gold? Right. So. So naturally, these lipids are not uh, optically active. So even you shine light, nothing would happen. If you coat gold on them, then we can start to, you know, the gold would, would absorb light energy and it would disrupt the vesicles or release molecules of interest. I see. Okay. Yeah. Nice. And make them shiny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we worked, uh, so far we worked with a number of different molecules just to show you that this method is scalable. So this include uh, fluorescent dyes, a second messengers, as well as different uh, neurotransmitters and peptides. For example, uh, we can uh, for, uh, introduce this uh, uh, second messenger molecule, put IP3 into the cell and, and induce calcium signaling in the, in the, in the neurons. We also spend a lot of time trying to understand the, uh, the gold coated nanovesicles. For example, understanding how the different density of the gold coating can affect the optical property. And you can see that uh, you know, only at a certain gold uh, coverage ratio, you can get to this infrared absorption at uh, you know, 800, 900 nanometer. Uh, what happens to the gold particle? So we, we typically use a very short laser pulse, so we don't accumulated heat in the brain and this does speed up the nanoparticle very intense very intensely and uh, it can lead to melting and uh, uh, aggregation of the gold particles while actually this you know this is only happening in the nanoscale actually the, in the tissue level you don't see any heating and lastly we're trying to understand how the molecules can get out from the lipid uh, liposome particle so just to give you uh, one more example, a uh, collaborator came to us and uh, he's making a virus based particles and uh, trying to encapsulate for example, drugs in them. And by coating our gold particle in the, uh, on the surface of the virus, we can we show that we can release the drugs. So now come back to the uh, neuromodulators, neuropeptide and diffusion in the extracellular space. There's a lot of uh, uh, imaging efforts trying to look at how the structure of the e, uh, brain extracellular space look like, or the ECS. There's a has also been a lot of work trying to uh, try to measure the diffusional properties of the uh, of the structure of the uh, in the in the brain. So how you know how fast the, the different dyes or nanoparticles dissipate away from the uh, your, your site of injection. Um, and, and also there's a lot of work trying to, very interesting work trying to introduce uh, fluorescent nanoparticles in the brain so that as it moves uh, randomly, you can start to you know, uh, draw a picture of the extracellular space. But actually now these are neuromodulators and the real neuromodulators actually in, interact with the brain uh, in terms of the uh, bind to the cell neurons and the other cells, they get taken up by the cells and they can degrade because of the uh, enzymes. So uh, we, uh, we're trying to measure the neuromodulators and peptides. So how do we measure them? Uh, I'll, I'll save all the equations here, but just to say that uh, if you introduce some, some uh, molecules in, in, in a medium, this can be a water, it can be a gel, it can be a brain tissue. And uh, if you follow them over time, you, are, if you, you, you can then back calculate their movement and diffusion and movement properties. So, for example, we if we introduce, so if we, uh, so if we introduce the, the nanoparticles into the mouse brain, uh, in this case cortex, an image under multi-photon imaging, and we can use a laser pulse to 
uh, release the dye molecules from the nanoparticle, and uh, you can then uh, analyze the, the quantitatively on the, on the images and obtain the, uh, for example, diffusion properties. This include, you know, how fast it diffuses, the diffusion coefficient, as well as the torturosity. Now, this is a steel fluorescent dye. So, how does this work for a, a real peptide? For a peptide molecule, it's intrinsically, it doesn't have fluorescent by itself. So, we have to use a sensor. And one of the sensors is called sniffers. So, basically, it's a cell based sensor uh, that are, it's a cell that are genetically engineered to express a certain uh, receptor, a G protein coupled receptor. And uh, well, it, it, it's you know because of the intrinsic uh, amplification, you know, the sensor, the molecule binds to the uh, receptor and it amplifies it into a calcium signal. Then we can uh, this affords a nanomolar sen sensitivity, so one of the most sensitive sensors uh, that's available right now. And uh, you can use this in vivo by implanting the cells in the in a live mouse in the cortex. And uh, we then designed some experiments. So how do we measure the peptides uh, modula, uh, uh, movement in the brain? Well, we can implant the peptide in one place uh, along with the sensor and I use laser to release the peptides and it would diffuse. Uh, and then we can, in, in, a, in a, some distance away, we can implant some, some more sensors that we can sense how far it takes to travel that distance. So this is, uh, this is how it looks like in, in, in a live animal. So this is where in the center is where the where the nanovesicle are along with the sensor. And at the distances, for example, this RI2 and on the bottom, RI3, are two different two sensors are two different distances. Upon photo releasing the peptides at the center, uh, we can see that the uh, sensors would respond with a time delay if it's further away, and by measuring a large, you know, different distances, we can say that, you know, at this particular condition, the maximum diffusion distance for this uh, peptide is about uh, you know, 250 micrometer, and it looks like, you know, at the at shorter distances, it's almost, uh, you know, synchronous, meaning a shorter distance, the the you know, the time to response is, is similar and a larger distance is starts to have some kind of delay in terms of the time segment in the cells. Uh, so what if uh, the, uh, the brain is a uh, uh, change? So to model this, uh, uh, in, uh, for example, if there's inflammation in the brain, there tends to be uh, the uh, brain extracellular space tends to uh, get degraded. So instead of having this long polymer chains, you would have very short segments. And uh, we can model this by introducing an enzyme to cut off the, uh, a specific molecule, this hyaluronin. Uh, and you can see that in this degraded uh, case, we have very few uh, staining of the, of the hyaluronin matrix. And then by measuring uh, the property changes in this case, we can see that if it's uh, if, it, if you degrade the enzyme, the diffusion would be a lot faster, and the torturosity would be lower. This is in contrast to an uh, ischemia case where the cells would uh, swell and the extracellular space would shrink, and this creates more torturosity. So the torturosity value is higher, and the diffusion is, is a lot slower. So this offers a way to accurately measure the the, the uh, transmission of molecular movement in the brain in live animals. To summarize this part, I think I hope I showed you that this we the nanovesicles would be a, a good platform for uh, photo releasing for many different molecules. They can be used in vivo and can be excited by the infrared light. And uh, and we have measured uh, you know different dyes and peptides in, in both healthy and diseased brain. So as a next step, we're looking at uh, to develop this tool so that it's simple, low cost, and you can apply different uh, you can apply different colors. Uh, so as a requirement of the NIH uh, brain initiative funding, we can, we're trying to disseminate so others uh, labs can use this tool. And secondly, we're working with uh, uh, 
you know, imaging experts try to uh, look at how, you know, if you locally release different neuropeptides, how does that affect the brain-wide activity? Okay. So, uh, so I would like to use the rest of the time to uh, tell you what we're doing in the blood brain barrier. As I mentioned, the, there's a, a lot of blood flow and very, uh, you know, you know, hundreds of miles of capillaries in the brain, and there's the blood brain barrier. I would like you to point your attention to this tight junction. So this is the junction between the endothelial cells. So that's kind of glues the uh, endothelial cell together. It's, it's so tight that even water molecule cannot go through. So how do people open the blood brain barrier for therapeutic delivery? Well, there's this uh, osmotic shock using mannitol, and uh, you basically inject this uh, into the uh, in, in, into the blood flow, and of course it causes a uh, high neurotoxicity and uh, open by opening the blood brain barrier in the whole brain. And uh, there's uh, recently there's a lot of interest in using the microbubbles and ultrasound. This is a very interesting method in the sense that this uh, gas microbubbles can be introduced into the blood flow, and they, are, they they can respond to ultrasound stimulation. So when you have ultrasound, you can you can activate the microbubbles to uh, to expand and contract to mechanically stress the blood vessel. Well, there's a lot of uh, interest in this method because the ultrasound can go deep into the brain. There's a, there has been some concerns as well. So uh, first, you know, there has been some reports in terms of. Uh, uh, this mechanical stretching can uh, diminish, can reduce this neurovascular response, so meaning how the how the brain could respond to the uh, neural activities changes. And secondly, there has been some uh, concerns about it, it might uh, disrupt the uh, connectivity between different brain, uh, between the uh, regions where you open the brain barrier and the other uh, brain regions. So the question we're interested in, you know, can we come up with some new or safer ways to get through the blood brain barrier? So, so this uh, comes to our uh, uh, method by using uh, nanoparticles and laser excitation. So the main idea is that if we can uh, functionalize our particle to target, for example, the tight junction that's, you know, on the, that's, you know, aligning on the blood vessel. Now we can, you know, can we use our laser to remotely stimulate the nanoparticle and in, in a gentle way that, you know, it would kind of perturb the, the vessel, but it wouldn't uh, uh, cause major injury. And what we think is happening is that uh, this actually caused a mechanical effect. There is some uh, pressure uh, from the particles. And this has turned out to be a, a very robust way to uh, to temporarily open the bourbon barrier. As shown, you can see here, you can inject Evans blue dye into the into the blood circulation. And uh, typically, it wouldn't get into the brain, but uh, if you shine the laser with a nanoparticle targeting, you will be able to get this uh, Evans blue dye into the brain. So next question we're interested in is, how does this... Uh, uh, you know, how, how does the blood brain barrier open? Is it, uh, are we enhancing the transport across the cells, which is called a transcytosis, or are we, uh, are we breaking the barrier between the cells, which is, you know, this paracell recovery, the tight junction? Uh, by looking at, you can answer this question by injecting different dyes into the uh, tracers into the blood and see, you know, which one ends up in the brain. And initially, it looks like both the red dye and green dye. So the red is small molecule, uh, green is a large molecule. So initially, both goes into the brain. And later on, by six hours, only the small dye goes into the brain. The fact that, that it's dependent on the molecular size suggests that this could be a, uh, a, you know, a diffusion, paracellular diffusion, because this you know, would depend on the, the width of the gap. To further confirm this, uh, we performed uh, elect uh, electron microscopy. So basically, we can inject uh, heavy metal tracers into the blood flow, and you can track you know, how, to what extent this uh, goes into the uh, goes into the tight junction. So this, if you don't have the laser, ends so halfway, and if you have the laser, the tracer, which is the dark color here, uh, goes all the way through the tight junction 
and it goes uh, behind the blood vessel, so in, uh, in the basement membrane, and also goes to the interstitial space in the, in the brain prime. This is strongly suggests that uh, we're actually uh, opening up this uh, uh, pathway between the cells that, uh, through the tight junction. So is this method safe compared with other methods? Well, we looked at a number of different uh, uh, markers, both in terms of the blood vessel, uh, as well as the uh, as well as the neurons, and in both cases we can see that there's no significant uh, injury in terms of the uh, blood vessel density or uh, looking at uh, the neuron morphology all the way down to the dendritic uh, spines. So how about the functional aspect? So we mentioned that you know the uh, opening the blood room barrier could impact the neurovascular response. Well, you can do an fMRI scan to look at this. Uh, you can also actually uh, look, look at this neurovascular response through a microscopy, look at the blood vessels. So what happens here is that when there is a neural activity changes, it tells the blood vessel to dilate or constrict. Right? And, uh, uh, and this leads to oxygen, you know, oxygen level changes in, you know, in the brain or in the blood vessel in the brain. Uh, so, so by looking at the blood vessels, specifically, you know, the small arterioles, uh, we can see that this, you know, there's oscillations in terms of the diameter. That's the constriction and dilation of the blood vessel in, in response to the neural activity. We can see that this activity persists even after we open the blood brain barrier. And in the venules, as a control, there's no no such response because the venules are not responsible for this uh, uh, neurovascular regulation. And we can look at uh, further look at the spectral response by doing a Fourier transform and say that there's you know different characteristic peaks over there. So basically, this result suggests that uh, this laser stimulation of the nanoparticles is gentle enough that it maintains the uh, functional neurovascular response. As a, a further uh, application, we looked at, you know, does this method allow the delivery of different uh, therapeutics? In this case, we looked at uh, the delivery of antibody, gene, and nanoparticles. Uh, in, in all of the cases, we can see that there's an increased accumulation of the antibody, uh, of the gene expression, as well as the delivery of nanoparticles, this lipid uh, liposome nanoparticle in the brain. So, to give a brief summary of this method, uh, so this uh, gentle uh, using the laser stimulation of the nanoparticle, we can open up the paracellular pathway in the blood brain barrier to allow uh, molecule chasers and therapeutics into the brain. And it does not disrupt the neurovascular function and it allows uh, antibody gene and a nanoparticle delivery. As an ongoing work, we're looking at uh, brain cancer for um, drug delivery, as the uh, as the brain cancer, as the cancer grows, uh, you know, initially the blood brain barrier is quite intact, and it it's when it grows larger that the you know in the center of the can you know tumor it becomes leaky, as you show as shown here, it's leaky to this Evans blue signal, but in the in, in the brain margin, it's still maintains a, a functional blood brain barrier. And the significance here is that uh, that with the brain tumor, the surgeon would come in and cut off the tumor core. Right? So they would they would cut cut off the tumor core, and uh, and it's the, the brain the tumor margin left behind that's causing the problem. So it's really the tumor margin that's causing the you know that's causing the problem. It is the opportunity on the back need here, and we're trying to. Uh, we're working on to, for example, using implanting a laser fiber into the brain after you take the tumor out and treat the uh, remaining tumor cells. Another area of interest is actually the spinal cord. So, you know, uh, as you can imagine, it might be challenging to get a laser to penetrate into into the brain. And it, and it, it's while it's still possible by working neurosurgeons, actually spinal cord represents another exciting opportunity because there's a lot of a spinal cord implant, uh, or you can easily implant a fiber into the spinal cord. And there's different diseases for the spinal cord and has huge clinical impact as well. 
in, uh, in tumor, in chronic pain, as well as spinal cord injury. And the spinal cord, as an extension of the, uh, of the brain, uh, it has actually a very similar barrier, which is called spinal, uh, brain, uh, blood spinal cord barrier, which is very similar to the blood brain barrier. So here we applied uh, our method to the spinal cord because the nanoparticles are systemically targeted, so you just inject it into the blood circulation. So it would end up in the spinal cord. Uh, by applying a laser, we can say that we, we, can, uh, we can open the spinal cord barrier and uh, you, can, as you can see the, the dye leakage into the spinal cord. Uh, we can further show this, we can use a, a, micro a fiber implant to open a tiny area in the spinal cord, as shown here. So this is a, for a mouse model, because the mouse spinal cord is very small. So you're only looking at a few hundred micrometers. And furthermore, this, this uh, transient opening, this uh, does not uh, disrupt the neuronal integrity or it doesn't introduce, uh, cause uh, astrogliosis or microglia activity, reactivity. To demonstrate the utility of this, uh, we worked uh, with uh, Dr. Ted Price uh, at the BBS uh, school, and uh, uh, he suggested a peptide called bombesin. So this is a, a 40 amino acid peptide. It acts in the central nervous system, actually causes a, a H behavior that, that's very, very sensitive on the animal. You can't miss it. And uh, uh, by designing an experiment, by opening the blood berry, injecting a bombesin IV, so injecting through the, uh, the, the blood vessel, you can see that uh, when you have an open blood barrier, the mouse would would start to itch like a, um, very quickly. Hopefully, you can see it. It's a lot faster on my screen. <laughs> uh, but you can see the you know on the left the, this two the, this um, this little two one these two little ones are not itching much, but on uh, the two on the right is the uh, Know, scratching and itching uh, quite intensively. Stopped. So we can analyze this data uh, more quantitatively and uh, look at okay if, if you don't have you know if you have the uh, intact uh, blood spinal cord barrier, uh, the mouse is not itching. But uh, if you have uh, the blood brain barrier open, blood spinal cord uh, barrier open, then the Bambesin peptide can get into the spinal cord and uh, act on the receptors and the neurons and start causing aging behavior. So this aging lasts uh, about, 10, about 10 minutes and it stops. And then this is consistent with the peptide clearance because the peptide would get uh, cleared out uh, get, uh, by the enzyme through, uh, within 10 minutes. As a next step, we're looking at the delivery of therapeutics for chronic pain treatment. So in summary, I've told you uh, two stories uh, focusing on the brain barriers. One is on the uh, extracellular space uh, diffusion barrier, try to measure their properties. And the second one on the uh, blood brain barrier, or blood spinal cord barrier, trying to get across this barrier. So with that, I would like to uh, take any questions you may have. Thank you. I had a, a couple of related questions. The first is going back to making this method, the blood leg barrier method work for um, human patients. So what strategies you know, um, do you envisage for getting the laser light into the brain? Right, that's an excellent question. And uh, you might imagine we can ask it from the AIH as well. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, there, I think there's a two kind of two views and which are I think both are correct. So why is it okay? It's very challenging to get into the brain, uh, you know, even if you can drill holes. Um, but I, I guess I'm more on the optimistic side where, you know, by talking with the neurosurgeons and if they need to take the tumor out, to cut the tumor out, then, you know, it creates a window for potential, you know, delivery, you know, that you can implant, for example, uh, optical fiber after the surgery and just leave it, leave, a, leave a port on there and then just, uh, just like a neural interface, you would, uh, it, it would uh, just uh, plug the fiber, the laser and uh, apply the laser. Uh, 
And second, to address your question, uh, I think uh, it's also a fair question. So we're started to look at you know, other methods. Can we, you know, there are the methods to, for example, using ultrasound to, to release light, for example, okay. or trying to, for example, thinking about, you know, can this be done with a magnetic field, right? which is, uh, can be less invasive. My, um, so my other question is that I can see how this method would be applicable for localized delivery. But my understanding is that one of the problems with the blood brain barrier is, of course, is um, people often want to give a drug to large areas of the brain. So you need to open up the whole blood brain barrier or, or a large amount of it. And I couldn't see short of flooding the brain with high intensity laser. I, I couldn't really see how that would work. So what methods are being developed that would allow um, large scale or you know large um, areas of blood brain barrier to be um, opened up at the same time yeah so uh, yes so with the laser we you know we've been working with the uh, animal models the mouse and uh, we can cover for example the half you know even the entire cortex uh, with a you know a couple of millimeters uh, but that's you know that's it um, you know you know of course if we think about a human Trying to get to a large area is a challenge with a laser. Um, of course, one can think about like a, maybe you know if one fiber is not enough, or we'll have an array of fiber inserting into the into the tissue, just like a, you know electrodes you would insert in high density electrode. But in this case, it's not; it has high dense, density. But that's one method. Um, uh, Second, we're looking at, uh, so we're, a lot of our testing are using uh, this green laser, 532 nanometer. I'm looking into a near infrared laser, which can, which has less scattering and uh, yeah. can penetrate deeper. Uh, so those are the two approaches we're looking at. Um, and uh, at first, you know, last one is uh, we're trying to see if we can do this with the uh, ultrasound and magnetic field, which so naturally would allow you to cover a large area. Are you concerned that if you go to like infrared laser over a wide area, you're going to get heating effects? You're going to be depositing quite a bit of energy. Right. So, so the beauty of this, uh, of like, can explain this in a simple way is uh, we actually don't have, you know, there's, you know, if we, if we measure the amount of particles that are deposited on the blood vessel, it's actually not much, and that seems to be sufficient enough to, you know. It could be, you know, there could be some. I think there are some mechanical sensors, um, uh, mechanical sensitive sensors on the on the blood vessel, like a piezo or triple A four, that are probably responsible for this uh, opening. We're looking into the mechanism, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but the beauty of this method is that we're using a, a pulse, laser pulse, a very short laser pulse on the order of like a picosecond, a billionth of a second. So this would only activate the particle. And if you and we try experiments, to, you know, to put a thermal camera on the brain and look at a temperature change, there's actually, you know, no noticeable temperature change. While there's a very intense heating on the particle, it doesn't. It's not sufficient to heat up the uh, the, the brain tissue. Cool. So there's nanoscale heating, you know, on the nanoparticle, the molecule, but but the tissue level, there's no heating. Is that just because of the heat deposition properties of gold versus some other type of metal? Is that? Yeah. Uh, so uh, you think about a way to to describe it. Um, uh, so so let's say uh, you can you know you can uh, you, uh, let's say you, let's say we're in this building. There's the kitchen kitchen where we're cooking. And but it's only in the kitchen that's you know in, in, close to the fire it's hot but everywhere else it's still like you know it's not being it's it's not you know you're not heating up the whole building that's kind of a, a way to think about it and the heating eventually will dissipate uh, but it, it you know there's a, uh, there's a, you know very uh, the volume fraction of the monoparticle in there is so small that even all the after all the heat will dissipate it's not raising the temperature for the tissue. Okay. Um, 
This main, this main question may have a fairly simple answer, um, but so my, my understanding of investments you're developing to bypass the blood brain barrier is essentially mechanically separating cells to allow molecules to move through as opposed to being conducted through the cells. Um, now, we know that one of the great paradoxes of how the brain is built is that blood is cytotoxic. Does that not dramatically increase the risk of a hemorrhage? Like, it seems like it could potentially be massively destructive. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So I've uh, actually spoken to, you know, a lot of people about uh, blood and berry opening and uh, you know, is this safe and, uh, um, you know, what, what effects can this cause? Uh, I, uh, I referred to, uh, I, you know, recently uh, talking with uh, Dr. Janela Koffer at Berkeley and she, she studies like uh, with aging, uh, the blood-brain barrier can become more leaky, and uh, you know it causes cognitive design and, and so on. So, so uh, one of the points, uh, one, one of the methods she uses is uh, she thinks is albumin. Albumin, you know, binds to astrocytes and then leads to beta signaling and inflammation and so on. Uh, uh, so, uh, one of the key observations is that if she, you know, she's introducing the albumin directly into the brain. Right, to model this uh, blood brain barrier disruption. Right? So, so she would inject to the ventricles or directly to the parenchyma. And uh, the reservation she made is that if the infusion is less than 24 hours, she doesn't see any damage or the neurotoxicity to the brain. But if you know she has to go beyond 24 hours to sort of like make a chronic leakage to cause, a, you know, a, you know, to kind of like push it over the uh, over the hill, over the boundary, to to, to cause a, a neuronal damage, injury and uh, inflammation, and so on. So I guess the, the general consensus is that the you know there's the the brain is designed in a way that it, you know, the problem barrier is there for a reason and it should be there. And uh, a chronic problem barrier leakage is you know can cause uh, brain injury and cognitive design, seizure, and you know different bad things. But if if you can keep the BBB opening for a short amount of time or as short as possible, that seems to be you know, the brain seems to be able to tolerate that. And, and, and just following that up, do you think there'd be any risk of cumulative damage and repeated use of this method? Right. Um, it seems like there might be some sort of accumulated insult there that would, that would yeah. increase the threshold or that would, that would make it more likely that something dangerous will occur after multiple applications. Right, right. So we uh, we have done this for uh, multiple applications, like for brain cancer. I, I didn't show a lot of data today, but uh, uh, there is a dosage, like we have to administer uh, drug three times, you know, in a week or in two weeks, and uh, there's a repeated opening of the blood brain barrier. Uh, I, I guess so the the short uh, answer is yes. If you accumulate enough, that that could cause a brain damage. But I think that's a threat. That threshold remains to be determined. I, you know, uh, I, I don't think anybody knows like how long is safe, right? Or, or if you space this out, let's the, the say you, you you do it today, for, you know, uh, and now you wait for three days or five days, the brain break that recovers, and you do it again. So, so there, I think there's an open question in terms of how long can you uh, open the blood barrier, um, and it, it probably also depends on the you know state of the disease state of the brain. If it's already, there's already some injury, there's already some A beta accumulation, there's already some uh, uh, damage, you know, uh, that, that could change as well. But it's, it's an excellent question. I, I think uh, it remains to be answered. Thank you. More questions from the room? Do we have questions from the online audience? No questions at this time. <clears throat> okay. Letting you off easy there. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for making a trip down here and, and sharing this really cool research with us. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks.